So I think it's clear eventually and sooner rather than later, we just, we, we need to completely get off coal. The, the world needs to just completely replace coal with uh, clean energy sources. And I think the cleanest we have and, and that are also quite cheap are, are wind, solar, and nuclear. And so I'm, I'm curious, you know, I, I didn't, I think there was, there's some discussion of wind and solar in your book for sure but almost almost none of nuclear was it was that a deliberate omission or do you do you have a preference between those three sources or what what do you make of that sure well look wind and solar are already very cheap globally and for i think about 70% of the planet they're the cheapest way of generating electricity now and within a few years it'll be true for the whole planet um nuclear is it's sort of in Australia, it doesn't really work. You know, we've got to have very large scale nuclear plants to be cost effective, at least in a, today. So, you know, dealing with 2000 megawatt plants and in Australia, we've only got 25 million people, you know, so um, the, the, that would have to be strategically placed. They also use a lot of water and Australia is very dry. Um, so there's a number of reasons why nuclear isn't a really good fit for Australia. It's sort of a better fit for somewhere like China, where you've got very high demand and very high population density and where the government will assume the entire risk of running the things. Um, so really it didn't, didn't even get to the, the start of the race in Australia. It hasn't been, a, you know, it's just never been a real option for us, which is why it wasn't in my book because my book was mostly about Australia. But I can talk about nuclear if you want. Yeah, I, I am. Um, I'm interested in it for a few reasons. One is because there's this, just this interesting economic fact that there there are huge fixed costs for building a nuclear plant mm. and I, i'm curious if you agree with this but what i've heard economists and 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 other experts say is that it's more expensive than wind and solar in the short run because of the massive cost of building a plant but if you zoom out to 100 years 200 years it's cheaper is that is that right it could be, but a nuclear plant's only going to run 40 years or so. Um, you've got to build a new one then. Um, you know, the, the best place to understand this common is France, you know, which, which in the 60s and 70s undertook a massive nuclear uh, building program. And I remember going to France a decade or so ago and realising there was no energy efficiency stuff going on. And, you know, that's for a good reason, because nuclear never stops producing. It's just high level. So if the electricity's there, you might as well use it. You don't need to worry about energy efficiency. Um, but what's happened in France is they're madly building wind and solar now because a lot of those nuclear plants are coming to the end of their life and they're all coming to the end of their life at once. So they've realised they need a more diverse mix um, to make the energy system really work. And for them, the absolute cheapest options are wind and solar. So they're retiring some of the old nuclear and building more wind and solar. So, look, I think there's a role for nuclear. It's probably going to be quite a small and niche role. You know, the... Nuclear has been declining as part of the energy mix for decades now globally. Um, you know, I think that really, in the, if you take the big picture and, and say, where, where's the future going to be? It's, it's all going to be wind and solar because that'll be the cheapest. And, you know, once we start in, um, on the hydrogen economy and start building electrolyzers at scale, um, you know, really that the wind and solar is going to challenge almost everything because you've got to, with hydrogen, you've got a fuel you can move around and use for a whole lot of purposes. Yeah, so you you have a a section of the book devoted to um, the next generation of airplanes. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Sure. Well, look, air, air travel is going to be the toughest nut to crack in terms of getting down to carbon neutrality. People are building electric airplanes right now. They're small ones because you know you can't have a battery driving a seven three seven or a, a Dreamliner or anything like that. It just doesn't work. The scale isn't there. Um, People are now building hydrogen aircraft. They're starting to, uh, and in fact, one of them that was built recently, I think in the US, uh, crashed, sadly, but, but hydrogen is being used as a fuel. The trouble is it's not a very dense fuel, so it's a, there's difficulties there. The best option seems to be um, a kind of a high-density biofuel, a fuel that's, or an e-fuel, that's a fuel that's made from uh, hydrogen, made through wind and solar, so you generate electricity using wind and solar, you put it through a water bath, you generate hydrogen through electrolysis, and then you use that hydrogen uh, through a process to create the equivalent of crude oil. But it's very, very pure. It doesn't have any of the 
any of the contaminants like sulfur in it. It's a great jet fuel, um, but it's expensive at the moment. I should just remind your listeners, Coleman, that you know, during the Second World War, the Luftwaffe flew on butanol made from potatoes. So we know we can make biofuels with a high density uh, in a way that can, can run an aircraft. The problem is cost. And as any of these solutions like e-fuels scale up, they get cheaper. So I think in the long term, e-fuels are where we're going to be with, uh, with, um, with aircraft, with jet travel. And I should just mention as well that the, you know, the, that e-fuel initiative through um, carbon engineering came out of Harvard and is now being developed in British Columbia. So it's a North American initiative. 